All right, everyone, if you have a Bible or electronic device, I'm going to give you a couple of passages of Scripture that you can turn to. You can turn to Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8. Uh, as I'm beginning, how many of you are just absolutely loving the humidity? Um, isn't it just wonderful? Like you walk outside. Doesn't it make you thank God for air conditioning, though? <laughs> like you can be in a room and it's so nice and you walk outside and it's like just reminds you of the evils of humidity. Uh, but it reminds you of the blessing of air conditioning. I know this whole week I have celebrated God over and over because of that. So uh, today we are continuing in a series, and I want to take a moment and do a, a more thorough recap. It's going to be brief, but a more thorough recap just because I need us all to get onto the same page. So about 10 weeks ago, we began a new series called Following Jesus. And, and we said it's not so much a series as a framework for the next year and a half to two years. And what we're looking at is this calling that Jesus gave us to be disciples. And, and what we address is that there is this tension that in, in some ways we have lessened the calling of God in our lives. In the modern day American Christianity culture, what we've done is simply given us the title of Christian. But the problem with that is if you go to every single Christian and ask them, what does that mean? It means something different for each person. A, a person could say, well, I'm a Christian because I was raised in the church. And the next person could say, I'm a Christian because I believe in God. And the next person could say, I'm a Christian because my parents were Christians and I was baptized as a child. And, and you could just go, and as many people as there are, many people claiming to be Christians, you would have a different definition of what that means. But when we look at scripture, Jesus never used the term Christian. And there's nothing wrong with it, but he never used it. The, the term that Jesus used was disciple. And a disciple is someone who dedicates their lives to mimicking their master. And, and in the context of Jesus' time, it would have been someone that would mimic their, their rabbi, their, their spiritual leader. And so what Jesus has called us to do is to follow him, to mimic him, to use him as the example and as the authority in our life. And so we're exploring what that means. But where we began in the series is once we defined what the series was about and these truths found in Scripture, we had to acknowledge the reality of the spiritual realm. And, and this is something that I think churches can err on two extremes. You can go to one extreme where you never talk about the spiritual realm, or you can go to the other extreme where you see a demon behind every rock. And I, I think both of those are unhealthy. Instead, what we wanted to do as a church is to address this reality. There is a spiritual reality. And the spiritual reality is coming against you. And if you don't know that, and if you don't acknowledge that, then really it's impossible to truly follow Jesus in the way that he's calling you because you don't even realize the battle that you're in. See, Paul says it this way in Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is a spiritual attack that's coming against each one of us. The spiritual attack that attacks you individually, it attacks your relationships, it attacks your marriages, it attacks your families, it attacks you on so many different levels. And so we as a church are beginning here saying we want to acknowledge this realm because what we also know and we're encouraged by is as we acknowledge this, we're not left empty-handed. We're, we're not le left with a lack of power. Instead, God gives us resources so that we can combat the spiritual attack against us. And so this is what we've been looking at. In Ephesians 6, 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And so this is what we've been looking at. We've looked at the, the armor of God. We looked at the truth. We've looked at righteousness. And today we're going to begin looking at the third piece of the armor. In verse 15 it says this, And as shoes for your feet, and so Paul is using the imagery of a soldier who's being dressed for battle, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given, and here's the, the third armor we're going to look at, the gospel of peace. Gospel of peace. The next weapon, the next armor is the gospel of peace. So, we, I, I like to pause at times and to acknowledge that there are certain words in Scripture that are not commonly used in everyday language, and gospel is one of them. If you're a Christian, you've heard the phrase, and you might know what it means, but simply put, gospel means good news. And so what Paul is saying is the next armor that you can use in your life in this spiritual battle that you're in is the good news of peace. And so we go, okay, why is this good news, and who are we at peace with? Well, today and over the next three weeks total, so the next two weeks after today, we're going to look at what it means. Today, we're going to look at what it means to be at peace with God, God with us, 
Next week, we're going to look at being at peace with God, us with God, and those are two different things. And then the third week, we're going to look at what it means to be at peace with others in our lives. But in order to fully understand the good news of why, why this is good news and why this is an armor we can use, we actually have to look at the negative side of it. We have to look at the flip of what it means to not be at peace with God. In Romans chapter 5, that's where I asked you to turn, in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, this is a passage of scripture that is near and dear to my heart. I, I've acknowledged this before, so some of you maybe have heard this, but when I was in college, I had a class, hermeneutics, where we were studying the idea of, of how to really look into and dive into a passage of scripture, what it means to examine its context, so what it means in the, the, the part of the book that it's located, what it means in the book at, in its entirety, what it means and connects to the testament that it's found in, what does it mean in relation to the entire Bible. And so the whole class was built around just really studying a passage of Scripture. But this is what was unique about this class. 100% of my grade was based on one paper. And so the entire semester, we studied this concept while we were researching, and I was given this passage of Scripture, Romans 5, 6 through 11. And so when I finally got done after the semester, I had 20, I want to say it was like 29-page paper that I, I wrote on this, and here's the kicker of this class. This class was at 7.30 a.m., and I'll tell you, when I was in college, I didn't know there was a 7.30 a.m. until I had this class. My professor, Dr. Starner, was a wonderful man of God, but he talked like this the entire time. So at 7.30 a.m., that was brutal. It is, and this is not an exaggeration, it is the only time in my life that I've ever drunk coffee. I, I hate coffee, I hate the smell of it, I hate the taste of it, but I was struggling, and I actually would stand during the class and take notes. And so I remember the first time I was in the back of the class, and I was just standing there, had my coffee on the, the ledge, and I had my notebook, and he just looks up, and he goes, Matthew, are you okay? And I said, Dr. Starner, if I sit down, I'm going to fall asleep. And he goes, okay, you can stand. So I started every week, and I took notes. But I remember when I finally turned in my paper, uh, they put it in our P.O. boxes that we had at the college, and I remember when I opened it and I pulled it out and I started to look at my grade, Dr. Starner happened to be in the room like a ninja, and he was right over my corner, and I didn't, my, over my shoulder, I didn't even see him, and I was looking at him, and he just goes, are you happy? And I was like, ugh! I was like, uh, yeah, I, I passed, I got a good grade, I'm, I'm happy, thank you, so... But the reason why I say all that is this passage of Scripture is really near and dear to me because I studied it, and it was like I, I really do believe God was implanting these truths in my heart back then because it would be a foundational message of my life and ministry. But when, when Paul is writing this letter to the church in Rome, he's acknowledging a potential reality that every single one of us experiences. So every single one of us at some point in our lives lived in this condition. We don't have to remain in this condition, but at one point we lived. But he describes us using three different words. We're going to come back and look at this passage as a whole in a few minutes. But right now we're going to look at three different words that he uses to describe us. In verse 6 he says, while we were still weak. In some translations it says powerless. What, what Paul was acknowledging is, at times, it, it, we have found ourselves where we are powerless to change our situation. And when he's specifically talking about sin, all of us found ourselves at one point in a situation where we couldn't change our sin problem. Sin separated us from God, and there was literally nothing we could do on our own to fix that. There's no amount of good, there's no amount of discipline in our lives, because even if we went to the extreme and we were the kindest, most patient, most loving people on earth, that is the bare minimum of the expectation of God for us. So there's no way to fix the sin problem. But on top of that, not only are we powerless to fix it, it's not that we even turn from sin, we continue in sin. So in verse 80 says, while we were still sinners. So not only is our past a disqualifier for us, but our present reality is too, because we continue to sin. We continue to disobey the commands of God in our lives. In verse 10, he takes it even to the next level. He says, while we were enemies, we were enemies, that we, we set ourselves up in direct opposition to God. And so Paul is going to use these three terms not simply to shame us because what he's doing in this passage, as we'll see in a minute, is he's using this to show us in this condition of our lives, God did something incredibly generous for us. But I just want to pause and I, I, I want to look at these three terms, weak, sinners, enemies. When, when Paul was stating this to the church in Rome, for some of this, this was their past reality. 
This is how they used to be. But for others, when they read this, and even now 2,000 years later, for some when they read this, this is your present reality. And, and so the question that I want to begin with this morning is for you to make this personal. Is this your past reality or your present reality? H have you surrendered your life to God in such a way that he could take you from someone who is weak or powerless to change your situation, constantly engaging in sin and an enemy of God? Have you surrendered your life so that God can transform you? Because if not, then that means you still currently stand in opposition to what God has for your life. And so when we just pause, we go, okay, how does this happen? How do we become weak and sinners, and how do we become enemies of God? I, I want to give you a simple definition because we all can make the choice at any point in our lives to become an enemy of God. Here's a simple working definition. You become an enemy of God when you set yourself up against what God is doing. Again, I want to say that again. You become an enemy of God when you set yourself up against what God is doing. And, and there are so many different levels that we can do this in our lives. First of all, we do it individually. Do, do you guys know this? I mean, this is a truth communicated over and over in the scriptures. God has a plan for your life. You guys know that? Yeah. Okay, so God has a good redemptive plan for your life. Scripture is clear on that. And when God is working in your life to accomplish that, he's doing it in a dynamic way. He's doing it through the situations he allows you to go through. He, he's changing your life through his Holy Spirit inside of you. He's putting you in situations that's going to challenge your faith. You're going to be dependent upon him. But in this process of God leading you on this good plan and transforming your life, you have a free will. And you decide whether or not you want to cooperate with what God is commanding you to do and leading you to do. Every single time in our lives when we choose to rebel against God in disobedience, even delayed obedience, which is just simply disobedience, in those moments, what we're doing is making the conscious decision to become an enemy of God, to put ourselves on the opposing side and resisting what God is trying to do. And so we do this in rebellion. We do this in disobedience. We do this when we put our hope in anything besides God, what scripture would call idolatry. When we begin to put our hope in the, the economy, in politics, in our own finances, in, in relationships, that, that we then stand in opposition to what God is trying to accomplish in our lives. We can do this when we deny Jesus as the authority in our lives, Jesus as our only hope. We, we put ourselves in opposition to God in our own pride and, and self-sufficiency, which is a horrible rhythm of our culture. I mean, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it talks about that God has actually chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise because the world in its own wisdom denied and rejected God because our, our culture is arrogant. Our culture is prideful that, that we as a culture believe we can survive without God's help and God's direction in our lives. Well, we embrace that same reality many times in our own minds and spirits. And when we do this, we set ourselves up in opposition to God. But not only do we do it in our own lives, we can actually become hindrances in other people's lives as God is trying to work in them and through them. We have a choice of whether or not we want to cooperate with God. And I want you to hear this. When you choose to be evil toward a person, no matter what they've done to you, you are setting yourself up in opposition to what God wants to do in their lives. And so therefore you become an opposition to God. And so in every environment that you're in, in your work environment, you might think, hey, this is just simply my job. But I want you to think on, a, on a, gr a grander perspective and viewpoint. God has placed you in that environment to either be for him or against him. And so in every environment that you step into, your work environment, your marriage, your family, with your children, when you go to a restaurant, when you go to a retail space, when you're driving your car, in every environment, you have an opportunity to usher in the presence of God in that environment or to resist what God is doing. And so if you're a divisive person in your workplace, you are choosing to set yourself up into opposition to what God wants to do. As a parent, God has a wonderful plan for your children. But when you set yourself up in opposition by allowing your kids to prioritize other things than what God has for them, you're placing yourself in opposition to what God wants to do. And the same reality can happen in churches. And, and I say this genuinely, I am so thankful that we have minimal drama in our church but there are some people that in their frustration with the brokenness of church, and can everyone just hear this? Every single church in the world is broken. Do we know that? Yes. You know why? 
Because a church is filled with what type of people? Sinners. Sinners, broken people, right? And so people, though, get frustrated with the church, which I get, and I'm not minimizing the hurt that churches inflict. I, I really am not. But when people set up to be divisive and to push back against churches, you're setting yourself up in opposition to what God wants to do. I mean, I think about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, before he was radically saved, it was the passion of his life to shut down Christianity. He was arresting Christians, even approving of them, them being put to death. And when Jesus knocked him down to the ground, the resurrected Jesus, if you don't know the context, it sounds like Jesus punched him, right? <laughs> Jesus and his spirit knocked him to the ground and blinded him. But when Jesus spoke to Paul, he said to him, why are you persecuting me? Who was Paul persecuting? The church, right? And Jesus saw the persecution of the church as a persecution against him. So the reason why I'm saying this is there's so many ways that we can become enemies of God. And, and this is a sobering reality. Every single one of us can make the choice to become an enemy of God, okay? So now let's build on that. So how does God treat his enemies? This is the question that we should wrestle with today. I believe there are three ways that God treats his enemies. There are three options. And we choose which one we're going to experience. Here's the first. God is hands-on. The supernatural resistance of God. How does God treat his enemies? Hands-on. He, he supernaturally resists them. And, and I could give you many different scriptures, many different examples. I mean, literally dozens, if not hundreds of examples in the scripture. I, I think of a few. I'll just name a couple. I think of the prophet Jonah. Uh, if you've never read the book of Jonah, you should, because it is one of the most bizarre stories in the Bible. It, it is, in many ways, lacks redemption on a lot of it because Jonah is just like the worst. But God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, which is the Assyrian capital, and preach to them a message of repentance because what was going to happen was God was going to destroy Nineveh. Jonah so hated Nineveh and the Assyrians, that's what the capital was, he so hated them that Jonah told God no. So he's this prophet, God goes, go tell them I'm going to destroy them and they should repent. And he goes, no, because if I tell them to repent, they will and you'll forgive them and I want them to be destroyed. So Jonah goes the opposite direction. He goes and he gets on a boat. And while he's on a boat, God brings such a storm that it becomes obvious to Jonah that he's the reason. So he tells everyone else on the boat, it's because of me. And they're like, what should we do? And he's like, throw me overboard. And so he would rather be thrown into the water and die than to go preach to the Ninevites. Kind of crazy story, right? So they toss him overboard and God supernaturally saves him, brings him back to the original beach that he depar uh, departed from and dropped him off. And God was like, let's try it again. And this time he went, and he didn't even have a better attitude. He went and preached, and they responded, and God forgave them. But you look at it, God supernaturally resisted Jonah. Or I think about that same group, the Assyrians, prior to this. The Assyrians were a wicked, wicked nation, brutal in how they treated people. And, and one time they came, and they were just destroying all the different cities of Judah and they finally surrounded the capital, and Hezekiah was king in the capital, and they surrounded. it. And one of the messengers of the king at the time for Assyria, his name was Sennacherib, was the king. He sent one of his messengers, and this is literally what the messenger said. He said to the, to the Israelites, he said, you should not trust in God because God cannot save you. Because our king has conquered every other God there is. Well, no surprise, God's like, hold my coke, right? I'm going to <laughs> handle this. I was about to say the other saying, and in my mind, I thought, that doesn't hit right. You guys know the other saying? <laughs> if not, you can Google it. All right, so, but that night, God sent an angel of death, and he destroyed, killed 185,000 soldiers, because God was proving when he wants to supernaturally resist, he can. But then there's a third story that I've taught numerous times here at the church. It's the story of Haggai, and in this story, God tells his people, he, he challenges them, he had supernaturally released them out of slavery, out of being in exile, to go back and to rebuild the community. But God said, I want you to go back and to rebuild the temple. That's the, the priority. Let's begin there. And they went back, and there was some resistance from the people, and so they gave up. And after about 20 years, God said, you know what? You haven't responded, so he's going to be hands-on. And what God did is he sent a prophet, and the prophet began to speak to them. And the prophet said to them, I want you, this is literally the phrase, speaking for God, he said, I want you to consider your ways. I, I want you to think about how things are going in your life. And he goes, like, he starts to give examples. He goes, you know, you, you plant a lot of crops, but you harvest very little. You have lots of clothing, but you're always cold. 
He says you, you work and you get wages, but it's like you're putting them in purses with holes in them. And God's like, do you want to know why that is? In, in Haggai 1.9, he says this, you looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, this is God speaking, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. What God was saying to them is, you didn't make my commands a priority in your life. You set yourself up in opposition. You started to focus on your own wants and your own desires, and you ignored what I commanded you to do. So God tells them, so I became hands-on, and I began to supernaturally resist you, and I began to push back. But here's what everyone needs to understand. This is the beauty and the redemption of God. Every single time God is hands-on, it's because of his love. God, this side of eternity, God never uses discipline and punishment simply for the purpose of discipline and punishment. It's always redemptive. In every situation, God wanted to get the attention of the people. God resists because God is loving. God resists because God is a loving father. I say this often, but I know as as a father, I resist my kids when they are doing behavior that is destructive to their lives or to our family. And I'm willing to match any energy they have. I am that dad. Anyone else that parent type of parent? My kids, they, they want to be calm. I can be calm. You want to take it to the next level? I have trained my entire life for that, right? <laughs> like we can go to whatever level you want. But what is the motivating factor behind it? It genuinely is love. I have four kids. I want them to grow up and be mature. I want them to grow up and be healthy. And most importantly, I want them to grow up and know Jesus Christ as not a concept, but as their personal Savior. I want them to connect relationally to God. And so I'm willing to push back. I'm willing to be hands-on. Why? Because that's what is needed at times to get their attention. Every single time that God is hands-on, it's because God is redemptively, lovingly pushing back because he has something better for people. So God is, first, he is hands-on. Here's the second way that God responds. He is hands-off. The supernatural release of God. One of the most sobering realities that we see in Scripture is that there comes a point when people's rebellion is so consistent and unresponsive to correction that God will take his hands off. And he will say, okay, I'm removing my presence. I'm removing my spirit from your lives. I'm allowing you to experience the full consequence of your actions. And I think one of the places that this is illustrated most vividly is in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says this, and I want you to notice the language. It's in present tense. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Paul, when dealing with this, because he's about to describe it in different terms, but he says, I want you to know what humanity is experiencing at this point 2,000 years ago, And this is still the present reality today. I think this is clearly what America is going through right now. But he says, I want you to understand God's wrath is revealed. God's wrath is being poured out. But it's not in the obvious of simply his hands on and supernatural resistance. I think it's much worse than that. What he's about to describe is that God has actually taken his hands off. And, And Paul, as he goes on, he goes, God's wrath is being revealed. Why? Because people rejected the reality of God. God goes, I have made it so obvious by simply looking at creation. You can't look at creation and not realize that there is a creator behind it. And that is the God you should pursue. That is the God you should worship. But the culture just simply rejected and they lived life however they wanted. And so he goes on in verse 21 and says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Why were their hearts darkened? Because that's the natural thing that happens when we harden our hearts toward God. There's multiple places, it's mentioned in Hebrews and multiple places in Scripture. God gives this loving, warning challenge to his people. He says, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. And what he means by that is every time that God challenges you, every time that God convicts you, you have a choice. And the choice you have is whether or not you're going to respond. And God's heart is the moment he speaks to you, the moment he challenges you. So whether that's just going about your day and the Holy Spirit just checks you, challenges you as you go about, I think hopefully we've all experienced that where there's just something in your mind, like you responded away, and there's something inside of you that's like, ah, you shouldn't have done that. 
or you're about to say something and you get a check like, hey, don't say that. I get that all the time. Anyone else? Um, or you just have a moment, you know, the Holy Spirit's challenging. Maybe it's in church, like maybe even this morning, the Holy Spirit's challenging you on something. Here's God's heart. The moment that happens, respond. Today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart, because here's what he's telling you. You have a choice. Either you respond in obedience or you ignore the voice of God. And when you ignore the voice of God, that begins the process of hardening your heart. I've oftentimes described it this way. If you, on your own skin of your body, if you rep repetitively rub your skin on anything, so if you work with your hands, eventually that would turn into a blister, but if you do that long enough, it would turn into a callus, that that skin will harden over time as a protection against uh, the wear and tear that happens. I think the same thing happens spiritually on our hearts, but it's not protection. Is that when we ignore the voice of God as he speaks to our hearts over and over, what happens is our hearts just become callous and become hardened. And he says, this is what happened to this group of people. God spoke to them. God spoke to them. God spoke to them. He did it through creation. He did it through his prophets. He did it through his followers. He did it through his word. But they ignored him over and over. And so he says, their hearts became darkened. And then in verse 28, and since they de did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. What God did is he said, okay, I'll take my hands off. I'll take my spirit off from you. And you know what happens when God removes his presence is you go aggressively toward darkness. And he goes on, if you were to read the next few verses of Romans, it describes humanity at its worst. Every form of evil became a part of culture. They created forms of evil. They celebrated forms of evil. And friends, can we agree this is what's going on now in our world, in our culture? That our culture is inventing new forms of evil and celebrating it as if it's freedom. Celebrating as if it's God's gift to humanity, and it's not. And so God can remove his hands. And in my opinion, again, this is just simply my opinion. In my opinion, that's worse than God being hands-on. God being hands-on, to me, there's just feels like there's hope because he's getting your attention, he's working, and like the idea of God just saying, okay, hands off, you're on your own. To me, that's heartbreaking and it's terrifying. So God is either hands-on or God is hands-off. But here's the third option that we see in Scripture. His hands are spread wide on the cross, the supernatural work of salvation. And this is what Paul was addressing in Romans chapter 5. That when we found ourselves at our worst, God did something unexpected. So I want you right now to imagine just the idea of being an enemy or the idea of conflict. So I'm going to give you a few different analogies. We've all seen American football, and I want you to picture the, the line, the offensive and defensive line. You know that place where the, the two behemoths of people are standing up, uh, apart from each other. And when you watch the NFL, I mean, the average weight is over 300 pounds on each side. And they say, like, when they hit each other, it's actually in the thousands of pounds of force as two people hit each other. I mean, it's, it's hard to even imagine. But I want you to imagine that in a football game, you know, they both, go, they both go back and they huddle up and then they just start moving toward that line, the line of scrimmage. And you know, why are they approaching themselves? They're, each other, I mean, they're about to do battle, right? Or imagine in a boxing match, they're in the corners, they're getting ready and you hear that bell. And what happens? They approach each other. Why? To knock each other out. Or MMA fighting, if that's your thing. You're on one side and you're moving around and the, and the judge says, let's go. And they go toward each other. Or picture the old school battle where they actually drew up enemy lines and they had swords and shields. And why did they approach each other? It was always to go to battle to win, to destroy the opponent, right? Here's what's so beautiful about our God. God went after his enemies, not to destroy them, but to redeem them. God's posture was completely different. Everything God has ever done to his enemies is, to buy, is motivated by love to get their attention, to draw them back. So now let's go back to Romans chapter 5. Let's read it in its completeness so you can see the redemptive heart of God. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's just stop there. When we were powerless to change our situation, it was in that moment that God said, you can't do it, I can that he came and he died on the cross for our sins. He paid the death that we owed. He took the wrath and the shame that we deserved. Verse 7, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, because you don't need to, they're righteous. Though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But here's the thing, we don't need to worry about because we were neither righteous nor good. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. What did, do, what did God do when he saw us as enemies? He came after us. He pursued us not to destroy us. He pursued us to redeem us. But this is the reason why this matters so much. God always engages his enemies. He always engages them. It is either being hands-on, it's being hands-off, or it's in offering grace. But in every situation, God is pursuing his enemies. He's engaging them. But what we see in Scripture is you decide the posture of God. You decide how God is going to engage you. At, at any moment in our lives, and this happens of Christians and non-Christians alike, we make decisions to put ourselves in opposition to God. God still loves us even in that position, but we make the choice. And so God commands us, we say no, we stand in opposition. But the moment we respond to God's conviction in our lives, we can turn and become teammates with God once again. And so in your lives, and I say this as a, a sobering, blunt statement, there are many of you that are calling things bad luck, which is really the divine discipline of God in your life. That we have a culture where we just say, hey, that's just how it is, that's just my luck. And what we should do at any time things go wrong in our life is just simply to pause and go, God, is this your discipline? Are, are you resisting me because there's something displeasing in my life? And God in his graciousness will always guide us. But we make the decision of whether or not we're going to put ourselves as enemies of God or respond to his conviction. But then here's the good news. I, all of that was the intro. Are you guys ready to get to the message? All that was the intro, okay? That was the negative. We can become and be enemies of God. But what happens, everyone hear this. This is the, the good news. What happens when we surrender our lives to God? What happens when we accept that wonderful gift of grace? We now become teammates of God. God now works with us. We work with God. God becomes the, the powerful force behind us. And when God is on our side, then everything becomes possible that God desires for our life. Now go to Romans chapter 8. I just want to break these last verses down one by one as I conclude. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul, who just a, a few chapters earlier said that God, when we were at our worst, God was at his best. Now he's going to describe what does it look like when God is not against you? What does it look like when you have not set yourself up in opposition to God? In verse 31, he says, what then shall we say to these things? And this is one of the most beautiful questions slash statements in scripture that you should just put to memory. If God is for us, who can be against us? The reason that God is for us is because he did all the work on the cross for us. And so Paul is asking the question, and, and I want you to ask that question. I, I want you to wrestle with this for a moment. If you are not at odds with God, if you're not an enemy of God because you have received his grace in your life, if God is for you, who can be against you? When, when we look at this, the reality of the spiritual forces that come against us, the spiritual forces try to manipulate and to discourage they try to attack us, and they try to paint a, a picture that's a lie so that we will believe and follow a lie. But he's saying, when God is for you, then what in the world can come against you? And the, the answer is nothing. Nothing can happen outside of God's perfect and redemptive will in your life. Isn't that good news? When God is for you, nothing can come against you. So when Paul says, hey, you have to put on this armor, and the armor is the good news of peace. What he's saying is when you have the peace of heart knowing that you are not standing in opposition to God, what you know then is the creator God of the universe is on your side. And if God is for you, there is nothing in your life that can come against you. And so when you feel that anxiety and that stress of life it, that I believe comes from the spiritual forces of evil, you can put those in their proper place saying to them, I know that my God is for me. And if my God is for me, nothing can come against me. And then Paul goes on in verse 32. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I mean, this is such a beautiful picture because one of the things that happens when we go through difficult times, when we fail, when we stress out in lives, when we have trials and things don't go as, as, as expected, 
There are times in our lives that we can start to feel like maybe God has abandoned us. Maybe God has not provided what we need. I believe, again, in temptation and in spiritual warfare against us. That's the message we hear over and over. God's not present. God's not able. But what he just described is he said, okay, just pause and logically think this through. God, who gave you his son to die on the cross for your sins, Jesus, who was a willful participant in this process, and it's a literal way of saying, if God gave you the most precious gift possible, do you think now he's going to withhold from you the things that you need in your life? Do you think he's going to pivot, and once he's given you the most precious gift, now he's going to give you garbage? Now he's going to not be present? Now he's going to forget about you? Instead, what we see in Scripture is that not only does God give us what we need, he goes above and beyond anything that we ask because our God is extravagantly generous. And so Paul is saying, guys, when you realize that God is on your side, it changes everything because in the uncertainty of mysterious times, you have the security knowing God is for you. He has been generous. He will be generous because that is who he is. He goes on and says, verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Again, I, I love this image. He goes, who's bringing a charge against you? Who, who is saying you're guilty? You know, one of the, the things as a parent that I often uh, am, am the recipient of is tattletale, right? Anyone else have that in your, in your families where they come? And, and as my kids get older, this becomes less and less, I have to be honest. But they'll come to you, and it, it's funny, they'll bring a charge against each other. My brother, my sister did this, and they'll tell you. And I'll tell you, in my experience of parenting, whoever comes to you first is always lying. It's just my experience. It is not the full picture. Uh, I have literally, this is a true thing that I've heard at times. I've had a child come to me and said, my sibling hit me, and I didn't do anything. And I said, you didn't do anything? No, they just hit me. And I'm like, I'm smart enough to know that's not true. Like, they didn't just walk up into you in the room and smack you, okay? So I go, okay, so you didn't do anything? Nope. Did you do anything back? Nope. So I call the sibling in, and I go, what happened? They go, well, I was sitting there, and we started arguing. They hit me, and I hit them back. And I go, you hit them? You just said you didn't. They go, well, I didn't hit them that hard. <laughs> and you're like, right, okay. So, but here's the idea. They, they bring a charge against each other. And he's saying, okay, in, in the spiritual realm, who, and obviously this is in the presence of God. He goes, who is bringing a charge against you? Who is saying you're unworthy? Who is saying you're unqualified? Who is the one that is speaking these things against you to discourage you and to shame you and to push you away from the presence of God? He goes, do you think it's God, the one who, who created this entire plan to redeem you? Do you think he now sits on his throne of grace and rejects you and brings a charge against you? I mean, it, it would be as crazy as, how many of you have ever seen these redemptive stories that I absolutely love, where initially someone is wrongfully convicted of a crime and they get sentenced to prison, and someone just takes up their case, and over years and years fights for their freedom, and when you see them finally freed, I mean, it is a joyous occasion. You guys have seen moments like that? It would be as stupid as someone spending decades to get someone free, and then when they walk out of the jail, as they, and all the cameras are there, the person goes, hey, on second thought, I think that person's guilty. Thanks, Ben, for the only person who laughed in this entire room. It's as stupid, as silly as that, as to do all of that effort and then to turn around and bring a charge against the person. And he goes, do you think that's what God is going to do? Then he goes even further, verse 34, who is to condemn? So who's condemning you? Who's trying to push you out of the presence of God? Who's trying to remind you of your past? He goes, Christ Jesus, the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is right now at the right hand of God, who is indeed is interceding for us. I mean, he paints the picture. He goes, do you think Jesus is the one trying to push you out of the presence of God when he himself died for your sins, was resurrected, conquering sin and death, who now sits at the right hand of God in his presence, interceding for you? I mean, again, I want you to get this mental picture. You, in all of your sin, walk into the presence of God. How are you greeted? God is sitting on the throne of grace with an invitation to come to him to receive mercy in time of need. And Jesus sits at his right hand talking to the Father about you in redemptive ways. 
You are being met by a God who wants you in his presence. And so Paul is saying, when you realize you are not an enemy of God, that you have aligned with God, that you have received his grace, know this, God always wants you in his presence. Then, and I will even say this, in all of our lives, when your life is transformed, there will always be a voice in the back of your head trying to speak to you, to discourage you. There will be people in your lives that will want to remind you of how you once were. I just want to lovingly say to you, there is only one opinion that matters, and that opinion is God's. What God says about you is truth. What God says about you will impact you for eternity. If anyone is speaking evil against you, to you, to discourage you, just know this, it is not inspired by the voice of God. And God's opinion is the only one that matters. And so then he goes on in verse 35, and he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And we're going to focus on this in, in great detail next week. So I'm going to go through it briefly. But who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. He's asking the question, so, so who or what can separate us from the love of Christ? And again, this is a question you have to answer. When God, when you surrender your life to God and you, he has you in his hand, who can separate Can someone bring an accusation against you? Can some problem happen? And and here's what I know. In in the seasons of life that are difficult, when God and his mysterious ways don't go as planned, it it can often feel overwhelming. It it can feel like God has abandoned us. It can feel like life has become chaotic. And again, I'm going to talk about this all next week. But when those moments happen, you have to pause and go, here's the reality promised by Jesus. Nothing can separate me from his love. Things might not be going as I expected, but my God is sovereign, my God is powerful, and my God loves me. And so then he says, and and this is where we'll end, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And this is, these verses here, I, I say this frequently, these are verses you should memorize, this is one. Because this should be foundational in your relationship with God. He says, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing that can separate you from God's love. There's nothing in your past that's already been covered. There's nothing in your present. There's nothing in the future. There's no spiritual force that can overpower God's love in your life. There's nothing can separate you when you, when you choose to surrender your life to God, there is that assurance that God's hands surround you and protect you. And this is why Paul says the good news of peace becomes an armor for you. It becomes protection. It becomes a weapon that you can use in the fight. Because when you realize this truth, that God did everything necessary so that you can be reconciled to him, when you realize that and you realize God, the creator, is on your side, then everything begins to change mentally and emotionally and spiritually. There becomes a security inside of you knowing that God is working things toward the redemptive. When life feels chaotic, it doesn't mean it's chaotic, it just feels that way to you. But God has a redemptive plan. And so the good news of the peace of God is that God has done everything so that you and him do not have to be enemies. And I wanna give you one last scripture. I love this in 1 John 4, 4. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Isn't that great news? Let me pray. God, I thank you that you are a God who is redemptive. I'm thankful, as as odd as this sounds, I'm thankful for your discipline. I'm thankful that you're hands-on. I'm thankful that at times you're hands-off. I'm thankful that you resist Because we know that whenever we respond to your resistance, you are also the God with arms wide open to welcome us back, to love us and to secure us. And so, Lord, I pray that every person here, that they will recognize that they have a choice. They have a choice whether or not to set themselves up in opposition to you. And I pray that as you challenge them and convict them, that they'll respond in obedience, recognizing it's the only way to truly live. Your way is best. So God, we love you. Thank you that you are a God of mercy. And Lord, to you we give all the glory. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen.